Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Larry Park Show. I'm Larry Parks, and tonight we're very pleased and honored to have as a guest Ms. Sandra Navidi. She is the founder and chief executive officer of Beyond Global. Previously, she was director of research strategies and senior relationship manager at Rabini Global Economics. She's a regular invitee for such uh, fora as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank meetings, the uh, 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 World Economic Fund, the World Bank, the Milken Conferences. She has had unprecedented access to European policymakers and particularly German policymakers. She's been present at many closed door meetings at the height of the recent financial crisis. She advises multi billion dollar families, offices worldwide, banks, and other financial institutions. And she holds a law degree from the University of Cologne School of Law in Germany and a Master of Law degree in Banking and Corporate Finance Law from Fordham University School of Law. Sandra, thank you so very much for taking time to come Thank on you, the show. Larry. So tell us, uh, how did you get into the business of being founder and CEO of Beyond Global, and what exactly does Beyond Global do? Well, I would go one step back and say that I started to work with Nuria Rubini, the economist, at the height of the crisis, and that, those, that gave me very good insights and connections. And so at some point, I just wanted to start my own company and go a step away from research and be a little more entrepreneurial, kind of build on the knowledge that I had. And when you were um, uh, uh, working with Rubini, um, I understood he had something like 1,800 clients. I forget how many. You know, he spoke for me, uh, yes. uh, and a really sizable business. I think you came when he spoke. Yes. Um, when when he was really at his height with his business, uh, exactly what kind of advice was he giving clients? What was that business? Is that business? It's macroeconomic advice. So he will look at. I mean, he was very prescient with regard to the housing crisis that had built up years before it happened. And he stood by his opinion. He was heavily criticized for it. And so people, I think he has very good insights and he has good gut feeling and he combines it with great analytical skills. So he will advise institutions, pension funds, corporations, governments, and tell them how he sees the world and how, what he thinks is going to happen. Yeah. When he spoke for me, I thought his presentation was absolutely brilliant. And uh, no notes right off the top of his yes. head. And uh, he had it so well organized. I mean, the man really is a genius in my view. So you were telling me before the show, you go down to Washington at the height of the uh, financial crisis. And what did you find? Well, I was very worried. And that's how actually I found Nouriel. I had read his stuff in 2007. And I thought he verbalized things that I couldn't have expressed. And I, and I and the, the crisis that was building up, the debt crisis. And so when I met him at a podium discussion, I said, you're on to something. Everything is going to happen exactly as you say. And that's how, at some point, we started working together. So when we went to Washington, for instance, in 2008, after Lehman had happened, I was I was very worried and scared, actually. I thought the whole financial system was going to fall off a cliff. And we saw all these people that if I mentioned their first names, people would know who I'd be talking about. So the highest level policy decision makers. And I thought we'd go into this brain trust and I'd be, you know, calm down because they have insight and they have the solutions. And what I found was that I was, it was very disconcerted, disconcerting and I was shocked at how they were helpless and they didn't really have solutions. So I think they, in the end, they kind of saved the system from falling off a cliff. But at the time it was very worrying and scary. Area, and I think we're seeing something similar in Europe right now. You know, years ago, there was a fellow, he's still around, Larry Lindsay. Do you know that name? Yeah. He was the governor of the Federal Reserve. He now has a consulting business. And he came out of one of these Federal Reserve. He was on the Board of Governors. He comes out of the meeting and he says, I don't know why people think we have special knowledge. Uh, we don't know anything that they don't know. This is, uh, he, he was on the Board of Governors at the, at the Federal Reserve. And recently, I did a program on... Uh, Hank Paulson, when he wrote this book, uh, I think it's On the Brink, and in about 30 different places he says things like, we were stunned, it was unexpected, we didn't know what was going on, so doing this by the seat of our pants. Um, they want to project, though, to the public while this is going on that they have plans. You know, I'm going to turn this dial, I'm going to do this. But your experience with these people, do they, what's your view, without naming names, do they know what they're doing or are they just like chickens running around without their heads? Well, it depends. Uh, it depends on the people. It depends on the context and on the situation. But I think when, when other people think there are conspiracy theories and people sticking their heads together and coming up with great concepts to, you know, I don't know, unseat the 
make the dollar fall or something. I think it's a gross overestimation of people's competence because the world has become so complex and difficult. People may know their field, but how it interrelates with other fields, it gets so complicated. I think we're seeing that in Europe with the politicians. It took them a long time to get a grasp on the financial complexity of the, of the subject matter. And so I think we're just muddling along and uh, you know we need leadership and so far I think we've avoided the greatest damage but we still have concern you know reason to be worried you know on this show uh, I've done a lot of shows on this issue on the economic uh, failures and I have no confidence in these people at all I mean our line here is that the whole system is dishonest uh, it's unauthorized by the Constitution who cares about that but also it's blowing up and uh, uh, like I said, and Hank Paulson, I mean, he had no idea what was going on. He wrote about it in his book. Uh, people want to have the feeling, though, that somebody's in control. So when you go down to these meetings, to say the World Economic Forum or the World Bank uh, meetings or any of these meetings, do you have it? In your, uh, do you get the impression that these folks know what they're doing, or do you have the impression that they're feeling their way? I mostly I have the impression that they're feeling their way, but there are so many moving parts. Right now, Asia is becoming so much stronger, and they're be having more of a say at the IMF, but also at the World Economic Forum. They're, be they're just, what they say has more weight. So everything is becoming more complex, and the problems that we're facing now have been building up over decades. So that adds to the problem. There is no real solution. There is no right or wrong. Like, what is the least bad decision that we can make, what has the least uh, you know, danger of unintended consequences. That's something that we need to be very mindful of because if we've learned one thing is that we have to be careful of what we don't know, the unknown, what is in the pipeline that we're not thinking of right now that may be blowing up. Do you have the feeling uh, from these people they're just trying to postpone the evil day? Just put it off? <laughs> well, if we look at Europe, what would happen or could happen could be so catastrophic that, you know, worst case scenario, I don't need to describe it to you, banks close and supermarkets are empty and social unrest. And in, in Europe, you know, we had two world wars that t took place not too long ago. So it's uh, in kind of people's DNA, the collective memory, they're very worried. And I think they're not trying to, f to fool anybody, but they're trying to buy time and hopefully you know, just scrape by to remedy the situation somewhat. It's something will happen good. I mean, they don't know what it's good, but they just hope if they just postpone it, something will happen. We will, well, I think there is a purpose, and that is to try and solve the problem as we go along. I don't see any solutions, do you? It's extremely complex and difficult. You know, in Japan, uh, one of the things, a lot of people in the, in, on the West don't realize this, but in Japan, they keep rotating people out of their jobs every couple of years. And there's a tendency to just put off the evil day until they go into the next job. You know, just somehow, just wait it out. Uh, and as a result, a lot of decisions don't get made, and a lot of decisions are made that uh, are inapplicable. I mean, they just, like I say, postponing the evil day. Do you see that in Europe as well? Do you see it in Germany, for example? I see it in Europe, and I see it here too. I think it's uh, inherent in the political system, and but it does provide some stability at the moment because their re-election in many countries, um, Germany is one of them, France, the U.S., and so the policymakers are trying to keep the system afloat because Sarkozy, the last thing that he wants is for Europe to blow up. Angela Merkel is trying to hold everything together, and it would be very bad for the U.S. president if something bad happened in Europe because that could tip the U.S. back in a recession. So that's why I think if push comes to shove, Probably the U.S. would stand behind Europe through the International Monetary Fund, and the U.S. taxpayer would indirectly also help Europe. Well, they've already blown up the balance sheets of these central banks by um, multiple trillion dollars. The Fed balance sheet has gone from something like 800 billion, I think it's three billion, three trillion plus now. Uh, the European Central Bank has gone from something like a trillion something today. It's roughly four trillion. Uh, same thing in Japan. Uh, it's like all over the world, they just think if they can keep creating money out of nothing, that somehow they can paper over this. Um, the question I'd like you to address, I mean, I don't know if you have a feel for this, but Germany had a, has had uh, along the way, especially in the 1920s, a disastrous experience with paper money. And one of the organizations that I go to here in New York, and I know you know it, uh, the American Council on Germany, and I have put it to a lot of Germans, 
a lot of high-level German people, how come they're not more mindful of the irredeemable paper ticket money? You grew up in Germany. You know these people. Why do they tolerate paper money? I think we feel there is no alternative. There is no choice. What can we do? People are very worried. You know, uh, historically, uh, Germany had uh, gold. I mean, the, uh, when, after the 1920s, they stabilized with the gold Reichsmark. Uh, I'm hearing anecdotal evidence, I have no hard evidence, that you can't rent a safe deposit box uh, in Germany, for example, I mean, to put your gold or whatever. Uh, do you get any feedback on this? Uh, anything at all? People uh, 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 getting out of paper assets into hard assets? Yes, I haven't heard that about the safety deposit boxes. I would say that they, um, yes, they are worried that their savings and that their paper money will lose value, absolutely. And I, I think that's why we see that consumption has gone up, because people buy that refrigerator or they remodel their house. They are trying to put it into something tangible. Also, real estate um, sales have gone up significantly. I haven't really seen a flight into gold. I don't know why that is. I think perhaps because they feel if, if things get so bad that we need to resort to gold to buy bread, then we probably should have other things like land where we can grow food. I'll tell you, I think it's a pretty scary situation. Let's, let's turn to the immediate flashpoint, which is Greece. And we were talking about this before the show. The Greece, uh, uh, the whole country is a little bit bigger than New York City. I mean, they have 11 million people. We've got about 8 million and change here in the city. Somehow they ran up $270 billion in debt, $270 billion. Um, obviously, they can't pay it. How is it that in Germ German banks are into them, French banks are into them? How is it, in your view, I mean, what's the feedback? How do they justify having extended so much credit to Greece? I mean, what do these people say? Well, I don't think they have to justify themselves. They just got high returns on it, and so they invested in it. And uh, they were considered riskless assets, right? Sovereign credit. So, and, and some, like Greece pension funds, they had to invest in them. Oh, is that right? They mean, by yeah. law, they have to buy government yeah. debt? Oh, isn't that a little boondoggle? I didn't know that. So they have to buy government debt. The, the Greeks institution, Greek the, the institutions. The Greek, the Greek yeah. uh, pension plans. Mm -hmm. Uh, so really what's happened here is that the government, the politicians, put the beneficiaries of these pension plans at risk. Of course, absolutely. And also you can't forget that there was a lot of fraud and opaque bookkeeping. People didn't really have a grip on what exactly had happened and, and about the size of the problem. And how do you see, from your point of view, or really from German, the German point of view, how do they see this playing out? What do they think is going to happen? Well, I think the Germans who are very conservative are a little annoyed that they have to pay up. At the same time, they feel bad for the Greeks because we do get stories from the front line and we, the, the ordinary uh, Greek citizen is really suffering. The unemployment rate is huge. So, but there is no scenario how this can play out well. Whether they stay in the euro, whether they go into the drachma, whether we conceal, uh, you know, they're already insolvent, obviously. We're just, you know, disguising it. Um, so. I think Greece will have years and decades of hardship ahead of it. But this may actually be a good point, if there ever was one, to push the reset button and restructure their whole economy. Because you, small changes won't do, and just austerity won't do. Austerity is going to stifle growth even further. They have to really start to grow something. So if they're going to reset, don't you think that Spain and Portugal and maybe France uh, and other countries should reset as well? Well, those are much larger economies, and I think they're in much better shape. Really, nothing compares to the shape that the Greek economy is in. No, nothing. Well, Spain has, I think, uh, uh, was it 30 percent unemployment? I mean, it's... Uh, it's not in good shape, but at least they have something to work with. They have structures, they have laws, they can be changed. Their, the mentality is different, their whole debtor history is different. I think they have a chance to turn it around, but there's no mistake about it. It's going to be hard and it's going to take a long time as well. Um, I am very pessimistic, as you know, about how that plays out, and I think that it's a foreshadowing for what could happen here. I mean, one of the lines on this program is that our government is floating debt where they have neither the intention nor the ability to ever repay that debt. That sounds like Greece, doesn't it? Borrowing money with neither the intention nor the ability to ever repay. 
And the question is, why would anyone lend any money to any entity that has neither the intention nor the ability to repay the debt? Because they buy your products. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you buy my products and you give me a promissory note that can't be redeemed? Yes, but by that time it's another person's problem. Um, I don't think this is going to work out at all. Um, back no, to the Germans. Every time I've gone to Germany, which hasn't been many times, one of the things that strikes me is uh, how industrious German people are and the fact that they're such savers. And uh, you can confirm that or, or speak differently. But I know from my own life experience, if I'm saving, I don't want to see that savings dissipated. What do the German people say about all this, aren't they? Why don't they, you know, you think it would make them crazy? As I said, they are very worried, and uh, they, I would totally confirm that they live be below their means. They're very conservative. That's why they can't, they work until you know they're in their mid late sixties, and they work long hours, and they can't relate to the Greek mentality. That's another problem. We have a problem, a political problem, a financial problem, and a cultural problem in Europe, and we have to align seventeen different countries, and that's why it's been taken so long to make decisions and come together. And these people have a history of not playing nicely with one another. And how does that come into the picture? I mean, are they going to cooperate in your view? Well, I think it could go either way. Um, we are very mindful of the past. The, the, the issue is somebody has to take leadership. France would love to take leadership, but it's not really equipped to. Germany can, but it doesn't really want to for historical reasons. We have to really tiptoe around the issues because there are great, understandably great sensitivities within Europe. I think so far Chancellor Merkel has done a relatively good job. Uh, German politicians could be in general a little bit more diplomatic, especially when it comes to Greece, because Greece feels very humiliated in this whole matter. But but this is what happens. I mean, you know, things become a little extreme in these situations. Talking about uh, sensitive to what happened in the past, you know, uh, I guess it was 60 years ago when uh, the Germans invaded Greece. Uh, a lot of people died. A lot of people died of starvation. But one of the things they did was um, uh, they shipped out all the food. I mean, anything that wasn't nailed down, they took. Are people mindful of that in, in Germany or in Greece, in your view? Do, do, do you know anything about this? Absolutely. I'm not an expert on the subject, but in the Greeks, Greek papers, they're regularly Angela Merkel is pictured with a Hitler um, moustache and outfit, and these references are being made. And, you know, on the other hand, Germans say, okay, we have to pay for this now. There's a lot of, it's very unfortunate, and I think that we could do a much better job in communicating. I don't think we have done the best job that we could. But it's not too late. I think people, as always, as they get along, generally speaking, and it's a small minorities that are extreme, but they're very vocal, so they get a lot of attention. Um, but to the Germans, uh, is, is there any feeling of responsibility? Yes. There is. Yes, but not because of that past, past so much, I would say. It's because we benefited also from the euro. And I think that's why we feel we now need to help those. Also, we, we want the, the European Union to stick together. We don't want to you know, expel Greece. It's not possible anyway. But we would like to have them in our community. And Greece, in and of itself, is such a small amount of money, we could actually pay for it. But now the problem has been dragged out for so long, and the risk of contagion has become bigger. So that's why this whole little country problem has mushroomed out of proportion. But I think even if Greece were to leave the euro temporarily, we would definitely want to keep on helping it and would embrace it back, would hope that it would come back. So when you go to things, say, like the World Bank conferences or the IMF bank, uh, conferences, what's the feeling there among the policymakers? Do they, um, are they resigned to doing something substantial? I mean, it really means out-of-pocket money at the end of the day for German people, for savers to give to people who don't have. Are they, are they uh, sanguine about doing that? Well, the whole situation seems a bit absurd because the IMF was created to help countries, you know, emerging countries, and now the whole thing has turned around. Now it has to focus on the first world and help those strong countries. Actually, it was formed to uh, a a after Bretton Woods, they wanted to keep the uh, exchange rates between the various countries within a, a small range. That was their initial mission. Right, but they monitored and exercised surveillance, but they were focused not on 
the developed world so much. Anyway, that's right. that's right. Anyway, so now I think there is, and and the issue is that to help individual countries who are in trouble that are isolated problems, that's fine. But now the whole world seems to be in trouble, and that's the problem. How do you? Is it's almost a, I could I liken it to three-dimensional chess. It's so complex. Yeah. Uh, our view, again, on this program is that the irredeemable paper ticket money is going away. They're going to have to change the monetary system. There is no way to save it because the debt levels are so high. Um, if you're a little country like Greece, you have uh, $270 billion in debt. How can 11 million people come house service or anything to do it? It's just, it's just too much. I will say that's what Germans are afraid of uh, is currency reform. And they check their little letters on the bureau bills to see which bank emitted it. And so, yeah, it's a concern. Which is why I keep saying, how come these people aren't mon more mindful of, uh, well, of, of gold? What are citizens supposed to do? Well, for openness, uh, they should, uh, uh, to save themselves, they should uh, put whatever they can into gold. So there's a guy here in the United States, his name is Bogle. He's founded the Vanguard Funds. And people would say to him, well, how much of my money, sh what percentage of my money should I have in your funds, in, in uh, equities or, and in bonds? And his line was, the amount you put in, in fixed income in bonds should equal your age. If you're 50 years old, 50% in bonds on the theory that you need security as you get old. So you want to be safe. And the safe way to protect your money for later is with gold. I'm, I'm surprised that you tell me that German people aren't buying more gold. You know, I mean, I've, I've put this to them. French people, by the way, they have a long history with gold uh, from the time of the French Revolution. Uh, and during, uh, after the French Revolution, and they had these assignats, uh, which came worthless. They started passing laws like wage and price controls, where you had to take the paper ticket money. And eventually, they passed a law called the Law of the Maximum, where if you didn't take the paper money, they'd kill you. And when Napoleon came in, he just went right back to gold. And a lot of French, you know, historically, uh, supposedly they have gold in the mattress. You know, they're, they're saving, uh, they, they're mindful of this. But gold can also be confiscated when things get really bad. It can be confiscated, but it doesn't depreciate to zero. But zero if I don't have it. Well, if you don't, that's why I say, you say, what should people do? I mean, it seems to me, uh, on, on an individual basis, you need to have some gold. But on a, uh, on a societal basis, they need to change the monetary structure. Uh, when you go to places, again, these conferences, and you have these top-level people, is there any talk at all about changing the monetary system? No. Not a word? No. Not a word? N no. Any, 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 um, uh, are they mindful of uh, major debt defaults? Yes, of course. That's discussed in detail. And also, uh, capitalism. Has capitalism failed? How we need to adjust it? Uh, these topics are addressed. But uh, currency, the currency, paper money specifically, no. Uh, when they talk about uh, capitalism, they think that paper money is a part of capitalism, legal tender, forcing people to use irredeemable paper ticket money. I don't recall having gone in that detail. Um, in my feeling of these folks, I've been to some of these conferences as well is that uh, they've profited immensely from the paper money and they'd like to keep it going. I mean, well, profits have been just so huge. I mean, you can't even imagine how much money some of these people have made. Actually, you can, because you know some of them. I'm not sure if there's a great master plan. It's just the system and, and a lack of alternative. What are we, we can't all walk around with gold coins. No, we can't. And, and no one's saying you should do that. Let me change the topic a little bit. Any discussions about sovereignty? Who's in charge? In terms of who's, who's who has it? leadership? Well, leadership, who's in, well, who should be in charge? So here in America, the notion is that the people are sovereign and the government is limited to the functions in the Constitution. Uh, in other countries, in some other countries, the politicians are sovereign. When you have a king, the king is sovereign. But is there any talk in Europe about sovereignty, about who should be in charge? No, but I think that the principle of democracy is being questioned, that you know people didn't elect the politicians to spend all their tax dollars to bail out other whatever, for whatever purpose. And you know, the bankers got bonuses even after they, their institutions failed. Meanwhile, for instance, in Ireland, nurses and teachers who render socially valuable jobs, their salary has been reduced to a minimum. And people ask themselves, how is that just? And how does that not challenge the principle of democracy? It's not just. 
let, let's, let's uh, look at a different part of the world. How do the Europeans view China and business with China? What do they see happening in terms of policy changes? I think Germany sees uh, a, a strong partner in China, a great market that one needs to be in, that it's very challenging. It's, it's not easy to get into China and do business there. But I think that Germans think they complement each other well on, on different levels. So I think it's a more, it's a friendlier view on China generally than the U.S. has. Do they think that the Chinese are going to bail out Europe or bail out Greece or bail out any of these countries? What's the they're view? hoping they're, they're hoping that they will. My own view is that you know, China has already gotten itself into trouble with the dollar amount that they have, and they will only rescue, they will only contribute to Europe if it makes sense economically, because nobody else wants to lose their job over a huge European problem. So. And they may just as well wait until things go down the drain and then buy distressed at great prices. Who knows? But I think if, if Europe gets its act together and submits a reasonable, plausible plan, then yes, chances are good that they will contribute something. Yeah, talking about picking up the pieces, uh, after the German economic collapse in the Weimar Republic, uh, one of the guys who was in business of uh, picking through the ashes was Franklin Roosevelt. And he had a business that we would now call a vulture fund. And they went over to Germany. They're buying uh, stuff for pennies on the dollar. You think the, Jap you think the Japanese, you think the Chinese are, are possibly have that as a strategy? I don't want to say that because I don't have any privileged knowledge of that. So it's just there are a lot of funds. A lot of money is waiting for this to happen because that's their business. Uh, so I don't think you know, business is business. They're not all ethical in our sense, so. Uh, new topic. Uh, one of the things we've discussed, and I, th I think you've read or seen some of the stuff I did on the notion of risk. And in Wall Street, as you know, the notion of risk means volatility. But to ordinary people, risk, as Warren Buffett pointed out, means that you may not get um, um, an increase in the purchasing power on your investment. Uh, what is the point of view for the Europeans on risk? Are they looking at risk the way Buffett looks at it, or are they looking at it the way Wall Street looks at it? Or do they look at it at all? I don't think they're looking at it in a very um, educated manner. They were completely off in the, in the run-up to the crisis. They bought all this risky stuff. They had no idea what they were buying into, and then they were so surprised when everything blew up. And so I think they completely underestimated the misrepresentation of risk that happened, now they're more aware. You know, here in America, people have not a clue. When I say not a clue, I mean zero. And I just got stuff from my broker who will remain unnamed. And they have something where they want me to specify whether I'm willing to uh, have risk in my investments. And they give you this chart, and they show you a higher risk, uh, a higher return, lower risk, lower return, and whatnot. But I know when they talk about risk, they're not talking about what I think is risk. They're talking about volatility, which is of no interest to me at all. Um, but Europeans, you say, are not mindful of this? No, I think now, after the crisis, they are more mindful of it. But risk is, first of all, it's hard to measure. You can measure it, but it's very difficult. But now we have uncertainty in the system, and that you cannot measure. So there is a problem where the risk blends into uncertainty, and, and that's why I think there is a lot of uh, people are confused. And they, and they save less? They save less, well, potentially, yes. they think there's yes. more risk in the future Yes, they spend, investing. Germans spend they more money. They save less. Um, just, Sandra, I wish we had a happy note, you know, to, uh, to end this on. Um, how do you see things playing out in general? I mean, is the, is the mood hopeful? Is it optimistic? Is it pessimistic? I think it's on a daily basis now when there's supposedly good news, people are cheering and the market stabilizes for a couple of days. I think that uh, people are in a wait and see mode. Germans are, they don't, I think they think that they don't understand the full scope of the problem and nobody really has a solution that much they have understood. So hopefully we'll continue to muddle along. Is there decent disclosure in the German press on these issues? Yes, I think the German press, the European press, has been excellent in uncovering many of the problems. Yes, the American press has been terrible, in my view. Uh, I mean, the kind of stuff they talk about, I mean, it's like from out of space. I don't know. I know where they're getting it from. They get it from press releases, you know, from the authorities. Um, but you say it's better in, in Europe? Absolutely. Um, German uh, newspapers, magazines, um, 
Do they talk about uh, this uh, trend away from savings? Uh, trend, yes, I've read it, but they drill into every little technical detail. So whatever you're interested in and in whatever magazine, you'll find something. The information is out there. All right. There's one more a big topic. I just want to spend a couple of minutes on it. One of the things that's uh, come to light here, I have a guy coming to speak next week. His name is uh, uh, David Goldman. He wrote a book called How Civilizations Die. And it deals uh, in large part with the demographics. And in Germany, uh, especially in Italy, in Japan, uh, in Spain, uh, the demographics are such that they're not replenishing. The populations are going down. Are people in Europe mindful of this? Very mindful of this, and that's a, actually an advantage for the United States that you have immigration, which we don't have in Europe. Yeah, the age pyramid is a great concern. And what do they say? What do they have? What, do they have anything, you know, to remedy this? I mean, what? Any policies? Any? Any panacea? No. Do they just wait it out, see what happens. Yes. So there's no action. Not that I can see. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why the? Uh, reproduction rate has gone down so much. I think in uh, Italy it's down to something like 1.4, should be 2.1. Uh, it's down in Russia as well, same thing in Japan. Have you given any thought to why that is, why people aren't having babies? No, but I heard that women who are better educated, they don't have to get married, and even if they have a partner, marriages are not as prevalent in, in Germany as they are in the U.S., and they have less children, and I think because people are very conservative, they only want to have children when they can be sure that they can have an apartment, they can afford it. I think Americans have many more children than Germans. They just have children. Well, actually, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, Latino people that, that have... Know, and, and they're very religious, like they're religious Jews, but uh, uh, regular people, uh, I think the, the reproduction rate is something like 1.9. It's below uh, replacement. Um, <clears throat> however, um, one of the um, surprises here is that very poor people have more children. So how is it that, uh, and it would seem as if you're poor, you'd, you'd want to have less children. How do you support them? And if you're rich, you could, have, you could have more children, but it seems to be going just the opposite. I don't know, maybe because poor people think that their children will help them when they're older? That was historically uh, the case with people on farms, you know, that they would you know, have a lot of hands. And the, uh, the longevity was such that babies didn't survive, so you had to have a lot. That fellow uh, Gibbons who wrote The Klein and Fall of the Roman Empire, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, his parents had uh, 14 children. They named them all the same name in the hope that one would survive. That's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Sandra, we've run out of time. Uh, this has been a really fascinating topic, and I'm really so thankful that you've taken time to come on the show. Folks, this ends the Larry Park show for tonight. We're very pleased that Sandra Navidi came on the show. Uh, again, she's the CEO of Beyond Global. Sandra, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Folks, please do tune in again next week, and good night, and God bless.